Hi everyone, I'm Alice and I'm currently studying towards a Master's in Modern Languages at Wadden College, Oxford. Um, my main language of focus is French and I specialise in post-colonial Francophone literatures, which is the topic that I'm uh, introducing today. Um, now this is a topic that encompasses a number of different concerns. Um, of course, the literature component is central here um, and literature forms an important part of many modern languages degrees. Um, but these terms post-colonial and francophone um, also allude respectively to historical and linguistic considerations within the literature in question. Um, and we'll return to the meanings behind these terms shortly. And I should add as well that although the main focus of this video relates to French, um, all of the resources will be included in French and in English so that everyone is able to engage with them. So we have three principal objectives within this session today. Firstly, we're going to consider what it actually means to refer to something um, or someone as francophone. And this will involve a brief exploration of where the French language is used around the world today. Um, we're then going to turn to the past in order to better understand that other key term, post-colonial. Um, so we'll be looking at some of the history and legacy of the French colonial empire um, and its impact on the populations uh, who were subjugated by France. In particular, we're going to focus in a bit more on that question of the French language and think about how it was actually used as a tool of oppression. And to help us understand this particular impact, we're going to look at an extract from an autobiographical literary text. So then our final objective is to engage in some close reading of a piece of literature, um, considering both its content and its form uh, in order to practice the skill of literary analysis. So before we take a closer look at the literature itself, we need a bit of context. So let's begin by considering this term francophone and what it might mean in relation to people, places and literature. So here's the dictionary definition of the word francophone. And we can see that it quite simply refers to the use of the French language, either by native speakers or as a lingua franca. Um, and lingua franca just means a language that is used for communication between people who speak different native languages. So we can use the term uh, francophone to describe regions or populations within which French is spoken. Um, we might refer, for example, to francophone Canada. Um, and the same applies for cultural production. So francophone novels, francophone cinema, francophone poetry, these would all be cultural forms that communicate through the medium of the French language. We might ask then if these uh, art forms are using French, why not just call them French? What is the difference between French literature and francophone literature? To reflect, to reflect briefly on this question, I'm gonna ask you to pause the video in a second to do a quick starter activity. I want you to think about and write down as many countries as you can think of where French is spoken by at least some of the population. You don't need to take too long on this, um, about a minute is perfect. So just pause the video now and um, see how many countries you can come up with. Okay, that's great. So hopefully you've got a few countries written down. Um, now I've got a map here that shows us where French is spoken around the world and there's a little key there at the bottom telling us what status the French language has in these countries. Um, now I should add that in the vast majority of these countries there are other languages spoken and often they are used even more widely than French but this just gives us an indication of those places where there are significant francophone populations. So there are actually 29 countries in the world in which French is recognised as the or one of the official languages. Um, all of these countries are marked on the map in either um, the navy or the mid blue. Um, so you can just about make out a few countries there in Europe, um, as well as a large swathe of eastern Canada, um, which are primarily um, French speaking. And we can see that quite a few countries um, there in West and Central Africa also have French as one of their official languages. And then there are also a few circles we can see in um, various oceans, which indicate some island nations that are also French speaking. And I'll show a full list of countries on the next slide. Um, but as well as those 29, we can see that there are several other countries where French is recognised as being a widely used language, um, but it doesn't have that same official status. Um, and these are the countries shaded in the lighter blue. Um, we see that on the map here in several North African nations, so there's Algeria, Morocco and Tunisia, 
and then there's a few other um, countries there in Western Asia. So here's a full list of all those countries where French is either an official language or where it is widely spoken. Um, well done if you got a few of these, but don't worry if you didn't get many of them. This exercise was really just intended to highlight that French is not only spoken in France, but is actually used in a much wider variety of places around the world. Um, and I'd say that looking at this list certainly helps us realise that describing literature um, in French from any of these countries um, as French literature wouldn't be an entirely accurate um, description of their cultural background, which is why this term francophone is most widely used in that context. Um, and there remains one more thing to address in regard to this list, which is that final column on the right there. Um, where there are listed several places around the world which are te actually technically a part of France. And, and these places are referred to collectively as la France d'outre-mer, um, or overseas France. Um, and although these places are outside of Europe, they are governed by and legally a part of the French Republic. So the citizens living in these territories hold French nationality um, and they have representation in the French um, Parliament, so they vote in sort of national and presidential elections. Um, and since these places are part of France, they are also francophone. Their other languages are spoken as well. French is the official language. Now you might be asking yourself, why are there, there are these various regions of France in the Caribbean, in South America, in the Indian Ocean? Um, and we might also ask how the French language originating in Europe found its way around the world um, and became a prominent language in so many countries and continents. And this brings us on to our next section on the history of French colonialism. So we've got another map here, um, but this time it is showing us the French Empire from the 16th to the 20th century. And what do we notice about this map in comparison with the one we saw a couple of minutes ago? I think it's quite striking the extent to which this map looks very similar indeed to that other map that showed us where the French language is spoken today. Um, and the reason is, in short, that the continued prevalence of the French language in many of these country, those countries is a direct result of their having been colonised and ruled by France at various points over the course of those five centuries. And as you can see on this map, there were actually two broad periods of empire in that time, um, as represented by those two shades of blue. So you can see that the first colonial empire in the lighter blue um, was mostly located in the Americas. There's that large area in what is today parts of Canada and the United States. Um, and then there are also colonies in the Caribbean, um, which are circled there um, in blue. Um, and then finally, there's French Guiana um, on the northern coast of South America. And then the second colonial empire from uh, 1830 onwards was mostly in Africa and Asia. Um, and you might have heard mention maybe in history lessons of the scramble for Africa, um, which happened at the end of the 19th century, when many of the European powers uh, tried to gain as many colonies as possible um, in Africa. So much of France's um, empire on the African continent was expanded around that time and lasted until the mid 20th century, um, that when there was a period of uh, decolonization across the continent. Now, that was the briefest of summaries, um, and it would be impossible to go through the entire history of the French Empire in a short presentation like this. But if you are interested in this topic, I'd really encourage you to, to do some independent research um, into this very important history. So I've mentioned this term colonialism quite a few times now, so I'm including here a broad definition of what this actually means. Um, so colonialism refers to the policy and practice by a powerful country of basically invading and settling in a country um, with the intention of boosting that dominant country's um, power and wealth, usually through the exploitation of the colonised land and people. So colonialism is driven in large part by economic and political objectives. Um, and another term that I've used a couple of times is post-colonial. Um, and this can signify a couple of things. Firstly, it has a temporal meaning. So we tend to refer to the period following decolonization as the post-colonial period. Um, but this term is often also often used in relation to literature. 
And when we talk about post-colonial literature, this can refer to writing produced either after or during the colonial period. Um, and usually it refers to literature written by people from formerly colonised countries. And it will often, though not always, um, address the experiences or effects of colonialism on a personal or collective level. So then post-colonialism is a theoretical approach and academic discipline that engages in the study of the cultural legacy of colonialism. Now, a final term or idea that I just want to spend a little longer looking at is the idea of colonial discourse or colonial rhetoric. Um, and these terms pre mean pretty similar things um, and are used relatively interchangeably in the field. Um, I've included some dictionary definitions there to show the slight difference between uh, these words. But both colonial discourse and colonial rhetoric refer namely to the ways in which France and other European powers thought about and described their own colonial projects, as well as how they viewed and described the people they were colonising. In particular, colonising nations sought to put forward certain belief systems that, in their eyes, justified and legit legitimised their colonial projects. Most often this would involve constructing a particular perception of the colonised cultures as primitive or um, barbaric, and arguing that it was the duty of European nations to civilise these populations. Um, and in France, this was referred to explicitly as la mission civilisatrice, meaning uh, civilising mission. And this idea was used for centuries as justification for France's colonial expansion around the world. Furthermore, France ut utilised this idea of the mission civilisatrice to legitimise the imposition of their own culture, religion and language on the colonised populations that they governed. So the colonised were forced to conform to these various aspects of French culture, whilst their own cultures, traditions and languages, many of which existed prior to colonisation, were actively uh, repressed by the coloniser. And this was put into practice in particular through colonial education, which is the focus of the piece of literature that we're going to analyse now. So the text we're going to look at is an autobiographical novel um, by the Martinican writer Patrick Chamoiseau, who is pictured here. The book is called Chemin d'école, which translates literally as something like the way to school, um, though the English translation of the book uses the name School Days. Um, and it's the second instalment of a trilogy called Une enfance créole, or a Creole childhood. And in this book, um, Chamoiseau narrates his lived experience of attending a school system that was still heavily shaped by the colonial discourses that we have just discussed. Now, as you'll remember from earlier, Martinique, where Chamoiseau is from, is one of the overseas regions that remains a constituent part of France. It's located in the Caribbean in what is known as the Lesser Antilles, which is that group of um, smaller islands on the right hand side of this map of the Caribbean. So just to provide some additional context about Martinique, um, as touched upon, France's Caribbean colonies were conquered as part of the first French Empire in the 17th century. And what is quite specific about these colonies in the Caribbean is that they did not just subjugate the indigenous population, um, indigenous meaning people native to that land. To that land. Um, in fact, they completely transformed both the land and its population by introducing sugar plantations, which they ran on slave labor. So after much of the indigenous Carib population were killed or expelled in the initial years of colonization, the French trafficked more than a million enslaved people across the Atlantic from Africa to the Caribbean, including an estimated 213,000 um, people transported to Martinique. Um, and as a result of this, these Caribbean islands became sites in which people from across um, different parts of Africa were forcibly brought into contact meaning that a great number of diverse cultures, customs, traditions and languages um, started to intermix and interact with each other. And one of the consequences of this was the development of a new language called Creole, um, which was formed over a long period of, um, of time from a combination of the French language and a wide variety of African languages that arrived on the island due to this history of slavery. Um, and Creole is the generic term for any new hybrid language that is formed in this way. Um, and Martinique and Creole is but one example of this type of language. Um, today, most of the population of Martinique speak both French and Martinique and Creole. Um, as in the rest of France, 
French is the only uh, officially recognized language. So this remains the language most commonly used in official um, and more formal situations. Um, but Creole is widely used in everyday settings and most children grow up speaking both languages. And whilst nowadays the two languages coexist in Martinique relatively harmoniously, this hasn't always been the case. As mentioned earlier, a significant aspect of colonial discourse was the assertion that French was the language of enlightenment um, and civilization, and that it should therefore be spoken at the expense of all other languages in the colonies. Um, and this attitude continued even after the status of Martinique changed from colony to overseas department or, or region um, in 1946. In fact, speaking Creole remained banned in schools in Martinique until the 1980s. So from this fact alone, we can tell that the realities of colonialism continued in Martinique long after it, in theory, um, ceased to be a colony. And Chamoiseau went to school in the 1950s and 60s. So this autobiographical text will provide an insight into the realities of that linguistic repression. OK, so here's the extract in both French and English. Um, now, the French is quite difficult in terms of vocabulary, so it's totally fine if you mostly use the English as we're working on textual analysis here, not French comprehension. Um, but if you can speak French, I'd encourage you to read the French text um, through just to get a feel of it. And before we get started on the exercise, I just want to comment on one piece of vocabulary that is used in the French, of which the meaning isn't quite clear in the English translation. And that's the word négrillon in the fourth and ninth lines of the paragraph. And this is a term that Chamoiseau uses throughout this whole book to refer to his childhood self, and it translates roughly as the black child. Now, this is a French word that is somewhat racially charged and does have the potential in certain contexts um, to become pejorative. However, it is important to note that here Chamoiseau uses the term very deliberately to describe himself, and doing so represents an act of reclaiming and reappropriating such language um, for a more neutral um, or even or positive use. As we can see, the English translator um, has decided to simply refer to the character as the little boy. Um, but I think it is important to be aware of those additional connotations within the original French. So moving on to our analysis of the text, we're going to split this process into two different tasks. Um, and in these two tasks, we're going to focus on two different considerations, content and form. Um, well, we might want to think of content as what the text is describing or narrating, whilst form is more to do with how the text is presenting that narration. So focusing on content, first of all, I want you to take a few minutes to read through the text um, a couple of times and think about how it relates to what we've just learned about colonialism um, and in particular, identify any parts which you think might exemplify colonial rhetoric. I also want you to think about what this text tells us about the impacts of colonial rhetoric on the people whom it is used against. Um, in this case, we're looking specifically at the perspective of a child. And I've included these questions on the right there. So pause the video now and spend a few minutes on that. Great, so hopefully you've had to think about this question of colonial rhetoric and analyse the ways in which the author shows its impacts on this character. Um, and I've highlighted here um, a few parts of the text which stand out to me as quite indicative of how those colonial discourses are put into practice within colonial education. So I've, as I've highlighted there in white, we can observe that the use of any Creole in school was absolutely forbidden. Um, and indeed, children would be physically punished if they slipped from French into Creole, even by accident. And then as far as colonial rhetoric um, is concerned, the writer highlights that the children were persuaded in school that Creole was a language of crudeness, vulgarity, delinquency. Um, and we've, we're reminded here of that so-called mission civilisatrice, whereby French was seen as a corrective force against these conceived ideas of Creole culture as supposedly uncivilized. Um, and I think these descriptions, which I've highlighted in blue, really epitomize that um, harmful colonial rhetoric. And then finally, I think one of the aspects of the colonial situation that this text portrays particularly effectively is the noticeable impacts of that colonial rhetoric on the school children. Um, and it's shown to have a really profound mental and emotional effect, triggering feelings of anxiety and shame, 
and to completely transform how the children view their own mother tongue. And I think my major uh, observation from the text would be that the child is shown to internalise that colonial rhetoric and come to accept it as truth rather than as the prejudice that it is. Um, and clearly the effects of this are deeply damaging. OK, so now we've had a detailed look at what the text is showing us. Let's have a think about how it is representing this situation by thinking more about the sort of formal aspects such as language, syntax, any literary techniques, etc. So I'm going to ask you to pause the video again in a second and reread the text with these elements in mind. And I've included some questions to consider there on the right to help you. Amazing. So there's a lot that one could comment on with this text. So I'm just going to draw attention to some elements that I found particularly striking. Firstly, um, in regard to language and specifically in, in the original French, I thought there was an interesting bit of wordplay going on in the sentence. Sa langue bientôt lui paru lourde. So langue meaning both tongue in the sense of the body part as well as language. So this gives us the impression that he is now finding it difficult to speak. Um, but could also suggest that his native language has maybe emotionally become a heavy burden for him. And then there's that term, Ababa Mustafa, which maybe felt a little unfamiliar to you when reading the French, um, and with good reason, because the author has actually used a Creole word here. Um, so if you felt a bit puzzled when you read this word, um, have a think about what the author might be trying to do there, um, especially when considering the sense of alienation that is being represented in this extract. Then in terms of contrast, there are a couple of descriptions that appear to produce opposites. So there's gentillesse, which means kindness or a nice thing, and mission, which means bad or nasty. And then we see something similar with détestable and amour, or hateful and loving in the English. And I would read this contrast as maybe alluding to the mental divide or mental changes that are being triggered as the child's perception of his own language is turning from positive to negative. And finally, I suggested that you consider the use of emphasis in the text. Some examples of this would be the author's use of what we call a tricolon, um, which basically just means a series of three consecutive um, words or phrases. So one example here would be um, his tongue soon seemed heavy to him, his speech too slurred, his accent hateful. Um, and this sense of the, the listing of effects might serve to emphasise the degree to which the colonial rhetoric is having a noticeable impact on the child. Now, there is a lot more um, that we could talk about with this text, but hopefully these exercises have given us an idea of the sorts of things um, that we might want to look out for and comment on when approaching a close reading or literary analysis um, task like this. So hopefully after learning about the French speaking world and about the history of French colonialism, um, as well as engaging with a post-colonial Francophone literary text, we can make a number of observations. Firstly, we have observed that the impacts of French colonialism around the world um, were pretty long lasting. Uh, a particularly noticeable enduring legacy is that of the French language, which is spoken around the world as a direct result of the former French empire. But we've also seen how the lasting impacts of colonial rhetoric and oppression can be felt on a deeply personal level. Secondly, I hope one of the main things that any budding languages students take away from this session is that studying literature in French does not restrict you to literature from mainland France. Um, there is such a vast array of Francophone literature out there to be studied, and by reading literature in French from other countries and regions, we are opening up for ourselves fascinating new cultural contexts. And then finally, hopefully the close reading exercise has shown that literature can be a really helpful tool to learn about the history and legacy of French colonialism. Indeed, such literary representations of this and other um, historical contexts might actually offer us a deeper uh, understanding of them on a more personal human level than we could get from history books alone. So if this is a topic that you're interested in, I'd really encourage you to explore other post-colonial Francophone texts um, and I'll be including some of my um, further recommendations of authors and, um, and books um, in the extra resources document at the end of this session. Thanks so much for watching.